In fact, I think we should start now. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. We have a community session, which is always one of my favorite, and I'm really glad to see you. For years, our main practice in the forum has been to invite one person up here, sometimes a couple or three or more, but a guest in order to take a dive into their expertise, to learn from their experience and what they are focusing on and what they're working on. But every so often, we take a break from that tradition. Instead of a normal guest, the guest is all of you. We bring all of you together in order for us to collectively think about the future of higher education from each of our standpoints, from each of our perspectives, from the point of view of our individual work. And that is something which I find emotionally very powerful and very satisfying. And I'm really grateful to do it today. Today, the occasion is the start of the fall 2022 semester. And so what I would love to do is hear from each of you what you think, what you're looking for, what you're anticipating. What does the future academic year hold for you? And in order to get things going, let me clear this out of the way, in order to get things rolling, I'm just going to share a couple of thoughts uh, based on my research, what I'm seeing right now. And then I'll open the floor to all of you. So please, at any point, feel free to chime in with something that I'm saying or to go completely in a different direction. Again, this is an open mic, an open floor for all of you to participate in. And by the way, as we've been doing for the past few months, our good friend Wesson Radomski is here uh, and they will help you if you have any technical glitches. So please ping Wesson if you have any issues at all. Uh, let me just mention a couple of the trends that I'm tracking right now, and then I'll turn it over to you. So one uh, that is very, very important is economic. Uh, that is, many nations in the world, especially Europe and the United States, have been enduring an interesting kind of op opposing trend. Uh, on the one hand, we've been enjoying very, very low uh, unemployment rates. On the other hand, we're suffering from unusually high inflation rates. The Eurozone has been hit especially hard on this, uh, and we know that there are many, many problems and dangers caused by inflation, including uh, pressures in higher education upward on tuition, as well as making it more difficult for families to be able to afford tuition and other payments. In terms of the uh, unemployment rate, it seems that this is causing, potentially causing people to not necessarily enroll in higher education because the job market looks so much more competitive a lot of data, a lot of complexity in that, but it's an interesting pressure on all of us, as we, especially as colleges and universities try to recruit students. So those two issues are very interesting. Um, also, uh, by the way, am I going too fast, too slow, just right? Give us a, a response in the chat. Lisa says, good. Lisa's tough to please, so I've, I've got I've to be um, happy with that. Um, a second point that uh, just came up in the chat um, uh, from uh, Ed and Carolyn is that of long COVID. So let me get to that. We have short code, if you will. We still have the dangers of infection and different campuses are responding in different ways. Uh, they have different regulations. Um, in, within the United States, the Biden administration is ramping down its COVID efforts. Uh, the pandemic is still pandemic. It is still killing several hundred people a day in the United States and sickening some much larger number than that. Uh, in fact, I'm here in Georgetown's campus. We are required uh, to be masked in all classrooms. Now, I'm not in a classroom right now, and I'm also by myself, so I'm happily removing the mask so you can hear my dulcet tones more effectively. Uh, but that's just one example. Um, so we still have these issues. and. The long COVID issue is one that is just growing in salience. So, of course, long COVID refers to the tissue damage suffered by people. Some number of people, maybe 10 to be 20 percent of people have been infected. And the tissue damage can occur in multiple places in the body, including the brain and the nervous system, uh, leading to brain fog or memory issues or coordination issues or joint pain. It can also affect other organs, leading to, for example, difficulty breathing or heart problems. And the heart problems may be actually quite severe. One of the reasons this is a major issue is, first, some number of academics, students, faculty, staff, um, have long COVID. And that is going to affect 
their performance and what they do. So think about what happens if you've got an administrator who has brain fog or what happens to a professor who is just perpetually racked with joint pain uh, or what happens to people who have to retire early because either you know, heart problems or brain functioning. All of that, plus the fact that there is uh, emotional and personal pain and suffering as a result of this. So that's one piece of the impact. Uh, second is the possibility that this may change the work environment as well. If we have some degree of the workforce that is weakened or driven out by long COVID, again, that impacts unemployment and that impacts how we prepare students for, um, for the workforce. And the third problem with this is that we may see medical costs go up even further because this means tens of millions of people potentially within the United States have long COVID who exert greater pressure and have more needs for medications, treatments, and all kinds of therapies. So we may see that problem as well. Um, so I'm tracking this as closely as I can. Uh, there's a great deal of complexity and we also don't have really good data about COVID in higher education. Uh, I would love to hear more and more of your thoughts about this. Um, in the chat, Carolyn says uh, there was an article on LinkedIn about compassionate re-enrollment uh, from Kim McNutt at CSU Dominguez Hills. Students may be stopping out due to long COVID, medical costs, and the usual reasons. Uh, Carolyn, if you can, as a librarian, if you can find that link, that would be great to see. Um, I'm not saying, wow, well, that's a happy story. I'm saying it's very, very important to see that. So this is a good point, especially as we're trying to keep students enrolled. So COVID in addition to macroeconomics. Let me add to this as well, some of the interesting dynamics that are happening now around demographics. Some of you know demographics is something that I obsess over and I've been researching for some time. There have been some interesting developments of late. Uh, one is that we are seeing the American lifespan drop seriously uh, by something like three or four years. And this is primarily as a result of COVID which especially kills older people, as well as a continuing problem, the nightmare problem of deaths of despair, uh, mostly due to alcohol as well as other forms of substance abuse. So while the American birth rate continues to lower, it may be that our mortality is beginning to accelerate as well, which is an awful thing. Uh, a second issue along with that is there's finally been some interesting public traction around issues of fertility. I'm seeing more politicians, more thought leaders, more people in the nonprofit space, and some business people, most notoriously Elon Musk, expressing anxiety about falling birth rates. Uh, and so this is a political third rail to grapple with. It's very, very challenging. Um, but I, I would expect to see more and more of that continue. And there's, there's no sign of American birth rates going back up. Now, the usual way that we have accounted for that or balanced that out is by immigration. And of course, immigration is not being that great either. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Carolyn, for sharing that in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Deborah says they have a new president who has implemented uh, stricter standards academically for students at her small college. So numbers are down the students in her courses seem to really want to be at college and to learn. They're all in person. Interesting, Deborah. So the quantity is lower, but the quality, at least of interest, is higher. By the way, Deborah, tell us what you're teaching. Um, also in the chat, uh, Tom Heyman's, we need to meet students where they are in order to stem enrollment declines. We assume far too long that they would seek us out. If higher ed is increasingly seen as optional, then we can't assume they're going to make the effort. So just really, really quickly, this is an absolutely good point, very, very important. Uh, over the summer, uh, I published a piece um, which got some attention about the idea that the, the a major consensus seems to be shattering. So in the United States from the early 80s up until a couple of years ago, we had a pretty solid cultural consensus that the more people go to college, the better. The more college experience a person gets, the better. And this was a bipartisan consensus. It was across all geographies. Uh, it appeared in everything from national politics down to high school guidance counselors to employers. It seems of late that the consensus is beginning to break down in a few ways. You're seeing it politically with more and more Republican skepticism about higher education, and not just Republican, but also independents and Democrats. But you're also seeing more and more anxiety, of course, over student debt. Um, and I'll get to student debt in just a minute. Um, but all 
Plus, we're also seeing some interesting anxieties about the quality of higher education. So it may be that COVID kind of hit that with a hammer, and now we're starting to see that consensus begin to weaken so that not everybody is convinced everybody should go to college. Uh, Ed notes that in addition to lower immigration, there's a huge backlog in U.S. visa processing worldwide, which may reduce international student numbers. Indeed, indeed, agreed. Um, and Sergio Costa uh, says, on my mind, at my school, enrollment for in-person is down, online and synchronous, all popular. I am concerned that the push to reach old goals and practices, there is limited interest in 100% in-person. Afraid we're not building on upskilling we did. I assume, Sergio, even by upskilling, you mean the increasing skills of teaching online uh, and learning online. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing examples of that across the country. That's a major, major issue. Thank you, Sergio. Um, in fact, you know, before I go much further, I'm going to make it easier for you to all join me on stage if you like. This big teal color box, um, this is a daring move on my part. If you press that button, it beams you on stage right away. I don't have to do anything. So you can just stumble on stage, leap on stage, climb on up as you like. Um, I'm happy to keep reading aloud from, uh, from the chat, but I'm also happy to hear your voices and to see your faces. Deborah, thanks for telling me about the classes. Uh, I'm glad you're Emeretta, um, but also glad to see you teaching English. Now, the student debt issue um, is, of course, a huge one because the Biden administration announced by executive order a new plan to forgive some chunk of student debt. Uh, I don't want to go into all the details right here, although if you would like, we can explore them together. But a key thing is, is forgiving up to $10,000 in debt, up to $20,000 uh, for those who have certain health conditions, uh, with an income limit. So people, under, people over a certain amount of income are not eligible for it. This has become a huge political firestorm. Already there are Republican ads and think pieces, Democratic ads and think pieces. There's a real question about how popular or unpopular this is and how it will play out in polling uh, matters because we have a major American legislative election coming up in November. Uh, so that is a major, major issue. Uh, I'm going to mention one last point, and then I want to turn it over all to all of you. Uh, and that's to do with geopolitics, uh, because right now the United States is engaged in some kind of new Cold War-ish experience with two world powers, with Russia over Ukraine and with China over a variety of issues, including Taiwan. And the reason I'm mentioning this uh, is because this impacts higher education in a few ways. Uh, one is that we've seen different academic units around the world try to distance themselves from Russia and to a much smaller extent Belarus. Um, everything from closing joint programs to making a show of not teaching Dostoevsky. Uh, so we're seeing some of that. And we're also seeing the obverse of that, which is academics trying to help Ukrainians who are academics who are fleeing uh, their country for safety or who are in country and trying to uh, be supported. Um, so that's one part of what's happening with geopolitics in the higher ed. The other is the Biden administration is continuing now a decade-long American stance of opposition to China, which has played out in some interesting ways. Already there are noises that Americans shouldn't collaborate with Chinese researchers on certain key themes and uh, fields, namely advanced technologies, biotechnology, AI, etc. Uh, there's also the U.S. trying to build up an alliance across the world, so it may be that we see more international collaboration collaboration, sorry, collaboration or cooperation with countries in those uh, in those alliances. And we may also see at some point a decline in the number of Chinese students who come to the United States. Uh, there have been some interesting numbers about that already. It's a little unclear, in part because of the, of the reason Ed Webb mentioned about uh, visas. But we may see this big battle across the Pacific play out in higher education. So those are a few of the trends that I'm tracking. Um, I'm going to go through the chat here and pull up some of the topics that you have all come up with. Um, and if you would like to uh, comment, again, remember in the bottom of the screen, we have all those different buttons. So just if you want to type in a question that you want me to flash on the screen, uh, hit that in the Q&A box. Um, and if you uh, want to join us and you're feeling bold, press that teal colored button next to me. And if you want to join us, but you're feeling a little shy or diffident, just press the raised hand button and I'll bring you up when it's especially good. Um, so going through the chat here, 
uh, Carolyn Coward has mentioned, uh, part of her work is in open science, finding a new metric to measure the influence of published research beyond the H index, citation numbers, and journal impact factor. Is there a better way to judge the effect of our scholarly work? Yeah, that's a great topic. Uh, and, and there's kind of two that are involved here and they're, they're both really, really powerful. Uh, one is that measurement issue and there's a lot of debate about what kind of metric we use to measure impact. And some of the metrics are published by companies and there's debate about each of them. Um, and I haven't seen one that strides forth as uniformly, universally accepted yet, um, but we need something better. But the other is open science. Uh, and we're seeing this both in terms of open access and scholarly publication, as well as open education resources. Um, open access, excuse me, just got a boost from the Biden administration uh, where the Office of Science Technology Policy just issued a directive that Previously, the federal government had a policy of encouraging, if not requiring, all scientists who, pub who create scientific research with federal funds have to publish their research in open format within 12 months. Um, There's a kind of 12-month embargo period. Well, the OSTP just removed that embargo. So if Carolyn and her colleagues work on a project about, say, planetary mechanics and it's published, it has to go open right now. So that's a federal push for open right there. Uh, open access continues to grow. OER continues to grow. Um, there's a lot, um, well, a lot of power for that. Flip side is what Ed Webb just pointed out, and my thanks to Ed uh, for uh, for sharing that. Uh, that he's tired, he's exhausted, uh, and I think this is true across the board in academia. So many of us have been for the past three, nearly three years now, being asked to do a lot more under increasingly bad conditions, uh, and in some cases with a lot less, thanks to the COVID pandemic, thanks to uh, the anxieties and dread experiences felt by our students, as well as the political turmoil within the United States. Uh, there's a strong sense that academia is being pressed to the breaking point. Uh, I hear you, Ed, and I, I wish I could give you a big hug to help you keep going. Um, I just wanna say for you personally, Ed, your puppy, um, is unbelievably cheerful and it always does me good to see a Winstagram shot. Lisa chimes in and says, yeah, I thought it was just me. No, Deborah agrees, we're weary. Um, and Roxanne brings in a related point here. Hello, Roxanne. Uh, noticing the reported teacher shortage in K through 12, and it doesn't seem to be at all impacting right, higher ed right now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that disconnect. Um, in fact, not to keep going back to national politics, but the Biden administration this week announced that it was going to be working with private providers to try to do, you know, beat the bushes in order to get more and more candidates for K through 12 teacher jobs, but did not reach out to higher education teacher ed programs in order to do more of the same. Uh, and I haven't seen any new activity in teacher ed and higher ed along those lines, although if anybody has, please let me know. Uh, but they, but this ties in neatly, I think, Roxanne, to the uh, unemployment rate being low, uh, where pe a lot of workers feel a bit more empowered in order to demand better conditions or better jobs. Um, plus, we have K through 12 teachers who are suffering the same kind of exhaustion and weariness that we all are in higher ed. Plus, they're suffering the, the real direct brunt of a lot of politicalization of education right now. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, John Hollenbeck wants us, and John, good futurist comment here, give it a year or two. This could be the next crisis as K through 12 uh, teachers leave the classroom. Yeah. Now, it may be that, uh, that a lot of local and state governments feel that uh, demographics are uh, driving this, you know, that the demand, the number of students may be smaller, um, but this is something we have to really work hard on. Of course, it takes time to produce a teacher who can teach in those levels. Let me scroll back a little bit more uh, and find some more. But uh, but first, Philip Lingard wants to join us. So let me bring Philip up on stage. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Um, just picking up on the uh, the shortage of K twelve teachers. Um, yes. There is a particular sector which is the English for foreign language. Uh, mm. the EFL sector, which I don't know what it's like in the States, but in Europe, uh, UK, Ireland, Malta, uh, more than 50% of the EF EFL teachers have left the, 
profession. Uh, well, because during COVID, obviously the um, you know, EFL is entirely private. So therefore they laid off the teachers. Um, the teachers are well capable of getting other jobs and they have done so. And so they haven't come back. And that yeah. is um, creating a huge amount of pressure at a time that you've got English um, students beginning to come back internationally, but there simply aren't the teachers there to teach them. Wow. I don't know whether that's the same in the States. Um, my sense, Philip, I, I, I haven't gotten the sense that, e, well, in the US, called ESL, English as a second language, um, that we, we haven't, I, I haven't seen the same kind of drop that severely. Um, but but uh, this is something for me to look for, and I would love to hear from other people if anybody else has noticed in particular uh, this decline. Uh, I wonder too, um, Philip, about how much of the decline is caused by uh, native English speakers, you know, Britain, Canada, the U.S., not traveling abroad because of COVID um, and not finding ESL jobs like that. I I, I think it's broad. Yeah. Um, the whole industry just effectively all shut down in 2020 and didn't reopen in 2021. So that's two years gone by um, when people who um, either had their lives arranged around uh, peak teaching during the peak summer period, but you know, that was an additional income to their normal teaching. Uh -huh. um, they've simply reorganized their lives and um, certainly the, the, the figures, uh, I'd say the three countries I'm aware of, Malta, UK and Ireland, um, are, dr are dramatic. Um, they say easily 50%. And they don't know where they're coming back from because um, whilst obviously uh, unemployment is higher in, in Europe, unemployment has also fallen dramatically here in the same way that it has in the States. So um, that there isn't that um, um, buffer of, of, of unemployed who, who would be thinking of taking um, English teaching uh, um, tuition and you know, doing the qualifications to come into the industry. What's the, uh, what's, what was Marx's term, the uh, reserved arm, reserve army of the unemployed? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, no, that's um, that, that's that's very interesting. I, I just tweeted this out, um, so I'm going to look for uh, to see if anybody has uh, any instances of this. Um, and uh, in the chat, people have related comments, but none that directly bear on this. And well, I have to say, I, I miss Malta. I haven't been there for a few years, and I would love to. Indeed, come back. yes, I'm always seeing you here. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and thank you for raising that. Yeah. If I may, just one um, one other point. Please. Looking Please. at the UK, um, the the UK is going through an extraordinarily difficult time, and I think that the university sector is likely to run into very severe trouble. Um, oh. All institutions are, are facing huge financial pressures. Um, I mean, some vice chancellors are talking about the price of uh, tuition going up from £9,000 a year to £24,000 a year. Wow. Because of the, the, the type of the problem. But also the impact of Brexit. Um, almost certainly we're going to see Liz Truss become Prime Minister and she will then sure. pursue uh, the end of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And the oh. direct impact of that is that Britain will be off horizon altogether. And that oh. will have a oh. huge impact in terms of the British research standing and the yeah. British universities. Wow. So there, there could be enormous uh, disruption in higher education in the UK. What's the, what's the time frame for uh, settling in with a new prime minister? Well, I mean, 5th of September is uh, when, um, I mean, it, it almost certainly is with trust, uh, is when she will be announced as an EPM. Okay. So it's only four days away. Well, that's a huge issue, especially given Britain's extraordinarily influential role, both in terms of research worldwide and, of course, uh, teaching students both uh, at home and, and, uh, and abroad. Um, well, that's, that's something... Thank you. We should look hard at uh, Truss and, um, and where she'll take us. And I'll try to avoid all the bad puns involving her name. I'll have to watch yes, her. Indeed. So, I mean, something to keep an eye on. 
that absolutely that, you know, that there is i think there is a an incipient crisis if not there now 12 months from now it could be a huge crisis well the, uh, my best wishes to you uh philip and i, I hope uh, you you weathered that crisis and thank you for sharing it with us uh, not at all okay pleasure uh, we have more, again. That's if you're new to the forum, by the way. And I think I don't know if any of you are, but if if you're if you are, uh, that's an example of a video question. So anyone can just join us like that, um, which is which is very easy. And it's of course great to hear and see everybody. But the chat box is on fire. People are just putting in comments of all kinds. Um, uh, Tom Hames is getting us as usual to do deep thinking about the purpose of higher education. Um, and uh, Suzanne, sorry, so I'm trying to read this and. Uh, uh, I'm actually having a hard time with my screen, uh, so I don't want to mangle your last name. I, it's hard for me to read. I think Suzanne Trelko uh, says the value and quality of higher education and education in general have been significantly derided by certain groups in the U.S. Yeah, that's that's part of what I was talking about, the, the shattered consensus that uh, the, the benefits of higher education, um, the perception that there are benefits is beginning to slide. Uh, uh, Vanessa Vale, hello Vanessa, says students, faculty, and prospective future faculty are on pause to see what happens next and changes before jumping in the deep end. What a great comment. What a great description of our moment. So we don't we don't have a, a clear, decisive change happening. We haven't declared, for example, COVID to be over. Uh, the war in Ukraine continues. We have the tensions I mentioned before still rumbling. Being on pause waiting to see what happens next. It's like we're at a phase change, about to switch over. Thank you, Vanessa, thank you. And again, if you, uh, if everyone else would like to join me on stage, I'll open the uh, uh, open podium there. And of course you can um, also just click the raised hand, but also type something in the Q&A box if you'd like something to be splashed across the screen as well as read out loud. Um, we have a, a Lisa Durf asks us to think about what if high school went for online asynchronous and offered community centers instead of school, and those teachers were shifted down grades. All undergraduate teacher ed programs prepared us to teach anything back in my day. Is it still the same? A great idea and great observation. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for tweeting out, Lisa. Really appreciate that. Um, there's also talk here about some of the credentialing of K through 12 teachers. Uh, Carolyn um, Coward mentions, uh, I think what's going on in Florida, of uh, Governor DeSantis pushing for uh, military veterans to be able to teach uh, K through 12 uh, more easily with fewer hoops to jump through. Um, and also uh, Joseph says there's a movement toward technological tools and self-teaching and learning. The short of your teacher is adding fuel to that. Uh, quite true, Joseph, quite true. Um, now, the, if, I, if I can just ask, we're about the halfway point of our session, and we're talking about the major forces reshaping higher education. Can I ask what you are uh, personally expecting from the next academic year? Um, for example, are you looking forward to a change in your student population? Uh, are you seeing a major shift in your own work in some way? Um, are there connections between the different trends we've been talking about that play a direct role in your life? Uh, just to give you a weird example, in, in my own case, uh, I'm teaching two classes this semester. Super majority of the students are international, which is really exciting, uh, very interesting. Um, also getting uh, my new book out, um, which is available for pre-order already. I'll tell you more about that as we get closer. Um, but I'm also traveling. Uh, to more and more uh, speaking and consulting gigs. I haven't been doing that for the past year, uh, but it seems like a lot of in-person work is ahead. So I'm going to be in New York, I'm going to be in Illinois, I'm going to be in South America. Um, so it, those are you know, little signs of, of changes in my life and seeing those connections there. How about the rest of you? What kind of personal future do you see for the next year? The awesome George Station uh, uh, responds to Vanessa's on pause comment on the anecdotal level uh, that it, that I think he's saying his first time uh, freshman engagement is slower and different. Uh, by the end of the second week, the 18 year olds are just settling in. And I guess George, that means they're, they're taking longer to settle in than before. 
uh, Deborah says uh, she's expecting more online graduate education. We have so much interest in that now. I hear that, especially as it's more and more, uh, well, we have more proof of concept, more and more use of it. Uh, Ed Webb notes that uh, Dickinson has significant focus on sustainability and international education. He teaches a bit in both, or a lot in both. Great programming this year around the IPCC report and around sustainable development goals. But he's concerned about whether a study abroad programs can recover post-COVID. Uh, by the way, Ed, hopefully I'll see you next month uh, going to Carlisle for um, a uh, uh, IPCC event. I'm looking forward to that very, very much. Um, how about the rest of you in terms of, uh, of either sustainability programs locally, but also in terms of international, um, excuse me, study abroad? Uh, are you seeing any uptick in that or any changes in that? Uh, George answers my question. Yes, it's taking longer to settle in, and they're hardly connecting with each other, except for athletes who I'm guessing already have an extra amount of socialization. That's very important, George. I, I don't have enough of, enough data on my end personally to experience that. Uh, our program is also, it's, it's a very small program, so it's a lot easier for us to socialize, but we'll have to keep an eye out for that. Uh, John Hollenbeck uh, says that he's interested in how Khan and other such free curricula are marketing themselves as remedial and preparatory resources for students returning to school. Um, yeah, that's a really good question because they are free and available material. And uh, if you're struggling with algebra or biology, the stuff is there and that's a really good use of it. Uh, Ed mentions that uh, they have lots of international students on campus as usual and lots of international content. But our numbers studying abroad are significantly down. So that's for, for him and for Dickinson, that's primarily study abroad. Uh, so the students haven't recovered yet. And then Tom, all right, this is just unfair. I have not yet brought Tom on stage. And, and you know, I just, every day I have to do that. Every week I have to bring Tom on stage. It's just, you know, part of the program. And, uh, and I, th I think he'll appreciate my shirt color today. Because Tom asked a huge question, and I, I want to give him a chance to voice it out loud. Tom, is that a new uh, microphone and boom mic? Not that new. I've had it since January or so. Oh, Maybe I've managed to keep it out of screen. I don't know. Yeah, it looks um, good. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, it was recommended to me by our mutual friend, Ruben. Um, mm. But yeah, I like it. I think it has pretty good sound quality, too. So, um, no, I, the, are, are you trying to get me to ask the uh, question I put in chat? <laughs> about regulating. Yeah. I mean, it's it just seems like... Um, you know, all of the things you're talking about, this slow uh, deterioration of, of um, um, enrollment, uh, you know, uh, problems with international students contributing to that. Um, a lot of people, you know, this idea that maybe college isn't for everyone that you were writing about this summer. Um, at some point, somebody's going to have to ask the question, you know, is, is what's going on here? Is it the system that is, you know, driving this? Um, you know, I've, I've been trying for years to get people to say, OK, look, you know, we can we're going to have this demographic change. It's going to happen. You know, it's 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 math. Right. I mean, you can see the numbers spooling their way through the system. You've been talking about this for a decade. You know, it's not news. So, you know, but what are you going to do about it? Uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the question there is, do you, how do you expand the audience? You know, if, if, if our only prime audience is 18 to 24, of uh, a percentage of 18 to 24 that are quote unquote college ready or whatever mm -hmm. college, you know, capable or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, then that number is going to shrink. So if you want to maintain this, then you've got, you know, you've got to figure, you've got to rethink, you know, who you're hitting with this. How do you change the informal nature of education so that institutions support that over much longer periods of time as a revenue stream, for instance? You know, um, things like that are not really being discussed. 
And on top of that, you get this slap in the face that we call COVID and the pandemic and remote teaching and all that sort of stuff going on. That again should be a wake up call that, you know, you saw time and time again, people falling back on very um, traditional ways of teaching that, you know, because they, you know, they just basically talked at the camera, et cetera, et cetera. And, mm -hmm. and the problem with technology as I like to say, is that it makes it, it, it shows the emperor with no clothes because this stuff was all being recorded before. These people were probably doing the same things in their classrooms and the students are sort of nodding and going along with it and everything, you know, and how do I pass the test? And that's all that really matters, right? Uh, and do you learn anything? And occasionally you run across a great teacher who goes above and beyond and changes the way you think about things. But that's a luck shot. You know, I could probably count those people from my own academic experience on, on one hand. Uh, out of the dozens and dozens of teachers and professors I had in my academic career. So, you know, this, there's something completely amiss with the way the system uh, treats, uh, the way we think about learning and teaching. There's a disconnect. I actually just posted a blog on the Shaping EDU site about open loop learning versus closed loop learning and the fact that I'm kind of, that I'm, that I'm, I constantly, that what's really come open, come snap in the face again. I mean, this is not a new thing, but you know, this semester uh, at this at the beginning of the semester is as I try to explain how my class works and my class is very much built on this idea of which you know, I stole from uh, Doug Engelbart of collective IQ and that that that, that we, we need to strive toward the margins and try to do things and grow as learners. And my students are like, well, what just tell me what you want me to write so I can pass. And that's a product of closed loop learning. I mean, we, we have trained them with the system for the last, you know, the last 18 years of their, or 12 years of their lives or however many years of college, uh, how many years, however many years of education they have, that this is how you do it. You know, you run your way through this little rat maze and, and, and you, you kowtow to the teacher and you pass the test at the end. And any learning that happens along the way, there's fairly incidental. Um, and so how do you know, and then higher education, you get to a point where it's voluntary. And there are people I know that ask, why would I pay to have this inflicted on me when I didn't like it when it was inflicted on me for free in K-12? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, and yeah. so these are all hard questions that I don't think anybody's really looking at. And, you know, I kind of wonder, you know, I'm thinking about systems theory and, and systemic uh, change. You know, what is it going to take for you would think that COVID would have just knocked things off kilter enough and maybe it will. Maybe it's just a delayed reaction. Um, but I, the trend I see now is actually in a lot of ways, there's a there's a there's a there's a big push to go back to quote unquote normal. Um, and I don't know if we can do that. I don't know if we have the teachers for it either. That's the other question. You know, we're losing the people who can can run the system too. that's 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 the one. Well, as usual, Tom, you, you've said several great things, and I, I, I want to grab them. And friends, I would love to hear your responses to Tom uh, even better. Um, Tom and I talk every day, and, and I'm sure he's bored of what I have to say. But, but, one, Never. but you, you mentioned one key structural component, which is that if, if we have a lot of faculty and staff right now who are not interested in doing something bold and exciting, in terms of teaching and on top of that as we established earlier a lot of us are worn out exhausted from the past few years well how do we go about changing that i mean so the one hand you have how do you transform the faculty who are pre and currently working but then how do you add more into the mix and we know it takes years to develop faculty at the college mm -hmm. level uh, so it may right. be that that's a long-term problem and that we have to so we need some kind of massive amount of professional development but at the same time, we have to do it in a way which doesn't burn people right out, uh, because we have so many, so much of that, uh, so much of that dread and pain right now. I think we need to deconstruct teaching and think of real hard about what you do in the course of a general semester, and ask yourself how much of that is uh, has to be done by you as a faculty member. How much of that is specialized in a way that has to do with your discipline? Or what you're, you know, what you're trying to teach, and how much of that is just, you know, pushing papers and and or, or pushing content, right? Which yeah. is out there anyway. 
um, you know, one of the things I've done in my classes is I've moved almost all of the content out of the live sessions. We rarely talk about content, except as it relates to the projects we're working on. We bring it in, but we don't, I don't start that way. And it's all in my Canvas shell. It's all recorded. And you just, you know, if you, if you need to know that, then you, you, you watch, you know, uh, watch it. And what I'm giving them in, the, in person sessions is how to learn and how to process the information, how to do things cool with it, you know, how to build communication and stuff like that. You know, how much of that can we use technology to distribute to where we got, we, we can, you know, put the experts doing expert things as opposed to doing dumb things. Quick, a quick question from the chat, uh, clarifying yeah. question, um, came from George Station. Uh, deconstructing versus unbundling, can you clarify? Well, when I'm saying deconstructing is I'm saying analyzing. You know, um, unbundling applies action, but when I'm saying deconstructing, I'm saying think. You know, I, I did an exercise a number of years ago where I very carefully took every piece of my class and or the way I teach and say, what exactly am I doing here? What's my intent here? How can I use technology to ease the workload, so to speak, on me, so that I'm you know not uh, so that I can concentrate on the student rather than the workload. And um, so that's, you know, and that, that's a complicated process. And it's one, it's a self inventory is what I consider good deconstructing. Okay. Unbundling is the, the second part of that, where you take that information and you say, okay, these are the parts that I need to do live. These are the parts where I need to be having a conversation with you, uh, a live conversation where we can talk back and forth. These are the parts where I don't need to be having a live conversation where you're sitting in the back of the room sleeping. So I'm going to put those parts where you can watch them when you're awake and when you want to, when you're, when you're mentally ready to engage with them. And then I'm going to leave the other parts in the classroom. And my classes are a lot more efficient. I spend, I actually use this as an opportunity to break up my classes into two halves so that I'm dealing with smaller groups of students. And each group only meets for half of the class time and the other half is online. And so I can essentially teach a 32 person class like it's a 16 person class, which, which is amazing. helps a lot. And, and, and Tom, as always, I tell you, and you hate when I say this, I, I would love to be one of your students. Um, but, but we have we have comments that came in, in the chat. I wanna make sure people, uh, you, and these I think hit you pretty directly. One is from Joseph who says, I'm not really pivoting anymore. The barriers between work and personal life are dissolving with online teaching. I am outside the LMS as much as in teaching, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, teaching on closed social media networks. The expectation for my students of a 24 seven availability is real. I just wonder what, what, if you want to respond to that. Well, I mean, I, you, you got to set expectations with your students. I mean, uh, I, I say, look, you know, I, I, I try to get back to you within 24 hours. But I, you know, I sleep between the hours of 11 and 5 or something or 10 and 5. So I'm not going to answer an email at that point uh, unless I have insomnia. Every so often I do. And I surprise, I'm sure I surprise the heck out of them because I'm like, I'm at 2 o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep. But um, uh, as I get older, that becomes more common. Um, you know, but uh, no, I mean, I, I definitely set boundaries um, in terms of uh, availability. I also schedule individual time into my class time. So every week, a uh, couple of weeks during the semester, I cancel the, the group classes and I meet with every student individually. And uh, instead, and, and I set that up as a scheduled time. Um, and so that time is, and I, you know, I prioritize listening to them during that time. These are the, and a lot of times I get stuff from students who don't normally talk in the, uh, in the, in the group sessions, you know, and, the, and, and I can concentrate on, hey, this is what I see you struggling. Hmm. Um, and, and that's immensely valuable because I can really target. That's another part of efficiency is targeting the learning. Um, As opposed uh, to. Yeah. So, John, I don't I, I don't work 18 hours in a row. I work, you know, I say, look, I've got a reasonable expectation of response time. If I happen to respond at eight o'clock because I'm sitting in front of the TV and watching a baseball game and I'm not really doing anything else. Yeah, I can sit back and send an email. Uh, but I don't feel, I don't feel enslaved by that in any way. And, and if I'm going to leave town for any, uh, any um, extended period, if I'm going to be traveling or something like that, I'll tell the students, yeah. I'll say, look, you know, I'm going to be unavailable because I'm going to be on a plane or something like that. 
just be aware, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. And I've just, I've not had a problem with that really. And I don't feel like it. It it it's not about. Everybody talks about the work bleeding into your into your uh, personal life, and I I've never really felt that as being you know I, I have personal life during the day. You know I don't work nine to five in an office where people are watching me all the time to make sure I'm not uh, playing solitaire or something. Um, and so during the day, I'll I'll take breaks. I'll go do something else for a while. I'll, you know, like everybody does at work, and they just don't tell you about it. The reality is, you just sort of integrate it all into an overall flow. And and there are times when you do say, "I'm sorry, I'm shutting this off." Well, I think so, you're I think you're ahead of everybody on this. Um, I have a similar and, a similar life and similar structure. But th there's a question. I had a conversation. Oh, real quick, I had a conversation with another faculty member this morning as part of a uh, oral history thing we're doing on the pandemic. And she said something really amazing in the sense that, you know, in the digital world, time changes. And we, if we, if we expect it to conform to the way it used to work, it's a little like evaluating um, aircraft on the basis of trains. And so we have to sort of think a little differently about how we don't work eight to five anymore. You know, we have little chunks of work here and there and there and there. And then we spread that in between the stuff, you know. So, I mean, it's 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 a different mentality. We don't punch the clock. Well, Sorry, sure. go ahead. Bert. You, you need to send me that uh, that naval wargaming title that you were recommending to me before. I, I missed it. Uh, Charles Roberts, speaking of wargaming, and he, he hates it when I keep saying this to him. Charles Roberts says, uh, in history and some other fields, you've got something like a one out of four chance of putting a tenure track job with a PhD. I'm not sure how much you can encourage bold instruction in a publish and still probably perish environment. You know, the, the biggest proportion of faculty in the U.S. are, are adjunct, you know, the majority are including um, and And so it's a uh, I guess that we, we, from some of the research we've seen, that if administrations ask adjuncts to be bold, they they become bold because that's a condition for hire. Um, but again, we're running into problems of, of, uh, of supply and exhaustion. But I run into disconnects on the same front. Front. I mean, um, in the sense that I had a situation this summer where I had a long conversation with an ADA counselor who was trying to figure out a different way to make my course work. And I'm like, it, it doesn't work a different, it's a design process, you know? Yeah. And so were there alternative assignments? No, but the assignments I do give are not timed and they're not set up in a way that would, I've never had problems with students with disabilities in this class. And as a matter of fact, every ADA letter I've gotten since I've redesigned my class, I've basically ignored because they're all about extended test times. We don't give tests, so that's not an issue. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, but the idea that you're doing something very different from the normal flow is uh, a real challenge, not just for the students to wrap their heads around, but also for administrations uh, and uh, things like contact hours. You know, how many contact hours? How do you measure butts and seats when there are no seats, when there are no chairs? <laughs> We're going to come back to that topic, I think. Tom, let, let me let you uh, yep. resume your chair in peace. Um, and okay. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for coming on stage. Thanks. Um, a bunch of responses camp in chat, and I just want to—I want to draw hoist a few of these up because I, th I think they're—they're—they're they're, they're awesome. Uh, Lisa Durf, a committed teacher, says if a student pops up in Teams, yeah, she'll answer them. Um, Deborah says that she's done individual visits in small groups for thirty years now. So you, Deborah, are another person ahead of the crowd. Excellent. And it drew real criticism at her three-year review many years ago. Now, no one questions it. It's always the challenge of doing something new. Always that challenge. Thank you, Deborah. Um, uh, and then there was another, oh gosh, a whole series of, of, of comments. Uh, this chat is just terrific. Um, George answers one of my questions. Thank you, George. Um, and then, uh, Carolyn Cower points out, uh, you don't need to teach facts. Facts can be found anywhere. Expertise is teaching context, analysis, understanding, and next level thinking. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then uh, Don uh, mentions being haunted by my comment um, about uh, this opportunity we have for doing 
bold and creative rethinking of higher ed, yet we're overwhelmed. And he asks a really, really good kind of leadership question. Is there a way to identify the innovators and run interference so they can meet this moment? Yeah, run interference and really support them. Uh, that's a good question, Don. Um, I wonder how that might play out at your institution. Uh, we have um, uh, more comments that are coming in um, and people are just, you know, talking back and forth, which I love uh, and it's great to see. Uh, I'm going to try and sum things up if I can a bit. Uh, it seems that all of you are seeing uh, certain things happening over the next year uh, and you're seeing certain things not happening. Uh, so you're talking about exhaustion, fatigue, a sense of overwhelm. Uh, you're talking about students who are coming to us, some for the first time, uh, with some disconnect as a result of the uh, COVID years. Uh, some of you are also talking about different ways of teaching and being creative about teaching that may or may not be supported. Uh, and yet at the same time, there's the sense that we're in a strange kind of interzone, a kind of interstitial moment where we don't have a clear direction forward and it's not clear what is actually happening in a major way. Um, and that gives a lot of us pause and makes it more difficult for some uh, in order to do something experimental and new. Um, it may be that some of the giant trends I was talking about at the very beginning of the hour uh, are playing a role here uh, in terms of everything from the economic stresses uh, to some of the flows of international students and uh, geopolitics. Um, but this is definitely a, a moment that has a lot of possibility. Uh, Josh Kim last year uh, found a interesting article uh, which called for us to avoid a snapback. That was a sense of trying to imaginatively drive teaching and learning back to fall 2019, you know, maybe January 2020. Um, and the there's a big push, a big desire to do that for all kinds of reasons. And we have to not let that snap back happen. I, I think that's, that's a useful phrase and an important idea, desire. Uh, Charles Roberts in the chat says, optimistically, while my mostly first generation students do seem less prepared for college, they also seem excited to get to it. And that's good. That excitement can make up for a lot of, of that. Uh, Carolyn says, we're in the zip disk VHS era of higher education, the transitional and uncomfortable phase. Uh, Carolyn, yes, we're in the era of jazz drives and scuzzy drives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Don says he's seeing the snapback. Um, and I need to wrap things up because we're just at the end of the hour. Um, uh, I, I shared something in chat before, um, just really quickly. Um, the uh, the uh, Dickinson College event that uh, uh, that I mentioned before um, about uh, sustainability. Um, we have uh, there's a, a nice website for this, and I'll put this in the chat. Um, I'll be there. I, I hope Ed Webb will be there, and uh, uh, I would love to hear uh, of anybody who wants to come to it. Uh, taking a look at climate change and higher education. So there's a link there in the chat uh, if you'd like to look at it. Um, you know, I, I usually summarize the uh, or wrap up uh, a future transform session uh, by you know sharing a few slides, and and I don't do that out of reflex. I do it out of deliberation. Uh, what we're talking about is vital for higher education, and I would love to uh, continue this conversation. Uh, and that's why I put this slide up, uh, so people can tweet like Lisa Durf has already been doing, um, and of course at my blog, uh, where it'd be great to see you if you have any, if you want to pursue this further. Still, uh, we've been talking about a lot of these issues over the past few years. We've had a whole run of COVID sessions, for example. We've had multiple sessions on faculty development, uh, and a bunch of sessions on students. And of course, throughout, we've been thinking about how to restructure higher education for the 21st century, for the present day. Uh, so we have all those recordings that are available. Uh, and we're continuing to explore more and more topics uh, coming up. Uh, we're hitting free speech and academic freedom, for example, coming up. We've got a bold plan to reimagine higher education along with uh, um, secondary education. We have more sessions on COVID and the climate crisis coming up. So you can register for those. And 
I would still really, really like to hear about any of the things that you're doing or anything that you're seeing. Just shoot me a note and I'd be glad to share with everybody else here. Now, I don't know about you. I love these sessions. Um, they feel smaller and yet more intimate. I love just that we can explore what we're thinking about uh, directly in the community. And I, I'm really grateful for all of you for taking the time and brain power to do that. Um, thank you all. Um, we can do another one of these, perhaps uh, December or January, depending. Um, if you have any suggestions for that, uh, please let me know. But again, as I say at the end of every session, please take care. Please be safe. Um, I love you all dearly, and I want to make sure that you survive and keep doing your great work within higher education. Uh, until next time, we'll see you online. Take care. Bye-bye.